Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1000 second new social environment. I'm Cal, the curatorial assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Nathaniel Oliver and Amanda Glibitzi. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Nathaniel Oliver imbues the tradition of black figurative painting with magical realism. Stage vignettes rife with symbolism, their landscapes are inhabited by figures, in Oliver's words, quote, grappling with their varied situations as black adventurers. Inspired by black art history, speculative science fiction, and cosmic jazz, Oliver layers references into elaborate narratives writ large in oil. Amanda Glubitzi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and art scene editor here at The Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art, design, and urbanism in the United States, Europe, and Latin America. Amanda is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York from Anthem Press. And now, Amanda, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Cal. Um, thank you for being here. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. And um, let me just say, too, before we really get started, um, congratulations again to everybody at the rail for now your 1,000 second NSC. Um, again, as I always say at the beginning, but it stays true, um, these are so much work and everybody puts their whole heart and soul into them and, and they do such a great job. So congratulations to all of you and thank you so much. So Nathaniel, so great to talk to you uh, about your work. Congratulations um, on your show at Karma, which is up until a little bit into March. So if everybody is in New York and hasn't been able to see it yet, make sure you get down to second and, and check this show out. as very, very much worth seeing. So as we get started, um, in the background, we're going to be looking first at images just of the installation of the show. And so I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about um, the title of the exhibition itself, and then also about um, the way that you designed the exhibition here, because there are definite um, correspondences across paintings. And so I'm really curious about what sort of story you're telling in the installation. Mm, okay. So um, we'll start off with the title. My journey was long, so yours could be shorter. Um, I think that for me, that derived from a space of understanding my ancestry, understanding that um, art had a long history as well, and that certain things were preceding the moment in which I was actually making the pieces. Um, it was sort of hinting towards a awareness beyond uh, my senses. Funny enough, that's one of the titles for the um, series, in the series. And the um, idea of having that as the title was just a way of paying homage to those people um, that inspired the work, the people that I feel as though were pivotal, that um, I feel as though I couldn't make the work without having them make their work prior almost um because I think that for me when I was making my series it was a connection to the um larger canon or the larger history of art that I was exposed to mm -hmm. and the curatorial choices made for the layout was to sort of activate the space as though you were following um sort of this like motion into the world that I'm building and the world that I've been like cultivating since maybe I would say 2020. Um, the first piece that you see when you come into the gallery is, well, the piece, the painting that's facing you is at what cost do I stay or go? And that's the one with the Mali drape textile. Um, that one is the entry point because there's sort of this moment where you're in the in-between state of my like realm in terms of like world building in the painting and the realm in which we actually exist in today. So it's kind of pushing that in-betweenness and you can actually see there's a figure in that painting sort of handing something from this like spiritual realm into the more um, grounded realm that we're in currently. So that's what I was thinking about with that. And then we move from there into sort of the 
grounds to validate the world in which I'm building. So I'm thinking about floral and fauna accents that are coming from different places. Um, some of them are grounded in like the, the realm of like the Caribbean area, um, local to those places. And then I'm juxtaposing those against something that's more abstract and painterly to just kind of push and pull what is the the truth and the the actual like world that I'm painting, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, there's a moment where um, the diptych, it used to be a diptych, at first it was painted together. And then over time, it got to a point where the paintings felt so full that they could exist on their own. So we decided to separate them to just give them that space of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And from doing that, I think that a lot of clarity came to me in terms of my understanding of um, narrative building, um, storytelling, and the way in which like you can tell someone one thing versus showing them another, and that can be two different interpretations. And which one do you validate as you know um, factual or not? Um, yeah, so that was like some of the ideas for that. And then it transfers from the like front room into the back room. And I think in the back room is where there's more um, of a confrontation for the audience. Like there's more danger in terms of the undertone. Um, there's a net that's being casted towards the audience. So it's like the audience almost is in this transcendental space of being like the hunter and the hunted mm. um, they they go back and forth with that dynamic um also think about the painting of one of my friends to the far left um she's holding the this ship while like she's standing on a ship that's how i'm interpreting the painting and the there's a moment where like she's sort of suggesting like she has a, a higher power or a better sense of control over the moment than um, the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a few questions for you based on what you just said. Um, first of all, the, the pronouns that are in your titles, you use of course a lot of I and you. And I was curious about this because of course, the, the title of the exhibition, um, you're saying my journey was long. So who is the my slash I in your titles and who is the mm. you in your titles? I like to go back and forth with the dynamic in which like I could be speaking of myself as the, the maker. Like mm -hmm. I'm the one that's on the long journey of making the painting and going through like the all nighters to make a painting. And then when I present it to the audience, it's a shorter experience. So it's like that one way is um, uh, interpretation of it. But then another interpretation of the my journey was long is thinking about the connection to um, like the ancestral efforts prior to. Um, it's hinting towards artists like in the Harlem Renaissance who paved the way towards black identity and black expression and me having that sense of awareness and bringing that back into my work. So it's almost um, cyclical, like the way that that statement goes out, because as much as you're the one with the like long journey and the other person has the shorter one, it mm -hmm. kind of flips on his head in moments where you're ending up the one with the shorter journey and someone else has had the longer experience. So it's just a way of sort of creating that conversation and that awareness that like your ancestors are awfully talented and like no idea is your own sort of like notion, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it kind of um, flips on the head, the idea of like, you know, the, the cliche, like standing on the shoulders of giants, you know? And so we always talk about that as like, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Whereas here your title is saying, actually, I was the one who had this long journey and now yours gets to be shorter and, and more, um, what profitable, productive, um, easier, Efficient, joyful, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Exactly that. Um, it's the sort of thing where 
I am, um, I, I don't want to use the word like approaching it with humility, but I'm approaching it with a level of reverence and thankfulness towards like understanding my role as if I was to be, you know, a giant or the person standing on the giant shoulder and how to like still have that respect and awareness of myself in that moment, whether I am the giant or the, the person being helped out. Mm -hmm. Um, so the image that we're looking at on the screen right now, this is the diptych that you were mentioning before. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, what's interesting about the install is that they are far enough apart that in fact, first of all, they're very hard to photograph together <laughs> in the space, as I know. And you can see mm -hmm. if you look at my Instagram, um, <laughs> like, they're like way over on the corners. Um, <laughs> But also they're far enough apart um, that they do a couple of different things. First of all, they they are clearly related to each other. And you can see that um, even, even in this image, um, if we're looking at it just on the screen, for example, the globe fits together. Um, the plant, we have two sides of the same plant on in either canvas, for example. Um, but they're spread apart enough that they don't have to belong together. And when we look at them just immediately, they don't look like they belong together because they're, they're enough apart. But also they're enough apart from each other that the painting opposite them kind of then slots in between them. And so it actually winds up creating a triptych rather than just a diptych. And so I'm really, really curious about this too, this decision to really spread out um, the, the relationship between these paintings and then also to triangulate the paintings here. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I believe our first time talking about it, when I was talking to the gallery about it, I had mentioned that I felt as though the painting had gotten to a point where they could live like without the other. And um, there was a painting that in my mind when we were doing the curation for the first time, like the first layout of it, I had a painting in between them. So like the Faith of Fishing, mm -hmm. that was initially the painting that was the story being shared from one side to the other. And that one actually is one of the breadcrumb moments where in the Faith of Fishing, the two figures in the left painting are in that painting. They're like present in that painting active. And I painted them as if I was thinking of them in like a younger stage of life. And then they were now reciting this story to a um, Sybil who was carrying on the story further. And um, I think that from having that conversation, the awareness to like have a space in between them became more like concrete. And the curators at that time, or the curators of Carver rather, they just ran with that idea and like followed it through. And it now sits very strong because that kind of the, the gap in itself helps the viewer feel as though they can jump into the world more. Like it creates almost that like blues clues sort of house makeup, you know, where now I can jump in after singing a song or something. Like I have now access into Nathaniel's world not to say it like that, but that's kind of what is happening and being conveyed in that moment. Um, it almost looks like a floating wall. Like I interpret it as this partitioner where I can like jump behind there and peek on either side of the globe. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of moments where like there's colors being used in the front room that creates this sort of harmony that I think in contrast to the room, the other room, the second space, those colors would disrupt that harmony or sort of um, confront that, that harmony in a different type of way. Like it's a different level of oranges and blues versus this blue that we're looking at right now and the blues like throughout it are um, sky blue. They're all kind of capturing the same time of day. Um, and there's no question or like, level of investigation towards the color that you're seeing in the space in those moments where the sky is present. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then to like move forward into like some of the other pieces. So the hues of May, 
that is a painting where I am trying to give the audience a moment to sort of like reset and take a breath and have the chance to like cycle back into this discord. So like this moment is for me very light, like it feels airy almost and hopeful. Like there's a lot of like aspiration in this painting that I feel is a nice, you know, cup of tea after leaving like the level of like deciphering you have to do to understand the painting next to it, which is the diptych. Um, yeah, so that was like some of the choices in terms of the curational aspects, placement. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what's going on in this painting? <laughs> um, in terms yeah. of the scale, in terms of how are all of these figures fitting into this landscape? Do they fit into the landscape? Um, you know, are they within it? Are they in front of it? Um, it feels, uh, especially the relationship of the landscape to the the middle ground figures feels very mm -hmm. like Manet working it out sort of thing. Um, can it, you tell it us? It definitely about was that. that. Okay. <laughs> it definitely was a moment where I was really giving way to a another form of application in terms of like how to go about painting um, like nature, nature that you're imagining um, and to create that space and distance. Um, there, sorry, excuse me, I'm saying um, a little too much for me, but there was a point where in art history, I learned about this term called fumato and it was referred to as like this foggy distance. And that was for me, like the mysticism in art, like how do I create that sort of depth with like just simple tools and simple um, applications of paint. But through understanding and studying other artists who preceded me, who had longer journeys, um, they were sort of giving me the shortcuts to how to approach that um, depth in painting. And that's why the figure in the midground, like their nose and the, the space of the tree is just, a far jump. I'm trying to push that jump as much as I can so that the figure in the um, foreground feels really, really close to the audience, almost as if you could like wipe the sweat off his brow, you know? Um, and in this moment, I think of it as a calm, like serene moment where things are at ease and like you're able to like let your hair down that's what the figures is doing in my mind is like in that moment of actually like relieving themselves. Um, the net's not being used at all. So it's kind of hinting towards a more relaxed state to activate sort of the um, daydream mm -hmm. realm. This painting um, very, very clearly is split in half vertically. Um, you know, and I mean, like, almost literally in the bottom yeah. part of the painting, right? Um, at, when I noticed that about this painting, then I started actually looking at the rest of the compositions of your, your work in the show and started noticing that that central axis is actually super important to your compositions. Either the paintings are split in two, so they actually wind up being like diptychs within a single canvas, or there's a central figure that causes that there to be a fissure down the center. Can you talk a little bit about that compositional device for yourself? Um, I think that comes from looking at a lot of paintings over time. And mm -hmm. I think that it comes by way of just building up my compositions. It, it just feels right. Like I, I'll, I'll move things around in my mind and change out the compositional layout of the place until it feels correct. And I think that that comes from a, um, lack of a better word, a trained eye, like mm -hmm. from having the ongoing like still life studies and, and live drawings um, that sort of helped me figure out like what creates um, an interesting composition and learning like the rules of threes. That was another thing that really pushed my understanding of like, oh, I need to add something more or 
what's missing is because I haven't put this third thing in yet. And sort of like having that awareness, like for instance, this painting, I think this, if I didn't name it what the title is today, I probably should have named it The Rule of Three um, because <laughs> there's just so many moments where three is um, being like repetit repetitive in the work. And you can see it in terms of like sky, sea, boardwalk, three figures, um, the the like what the turnstile, the tickets and the chicken, um, the three loops in the back. Like I can cut it down into that sort of understanding of composition. And mm -hmm. I think that comes after making it though. Like after I've sat back and looked at it, I'm like, oh, I'm doing that thing again. So it's like something I have to like sort of unlearn almost so that I can like keep pushing forward and keep things together. But I definitely am aware of that, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a, a good painting to pause on because um, again, there are so many of the things we've already talked about are, are shown in this painting. But one of the things I was noticing here is this play between positive and negative space as well. Um, you know, like what really pu pushes to the foreground to our eye and what moves to the background. Um, and then also this play between things that are pretty highly finished and areas of the canvas that are deliberately not as finished. Um, so if we want to throw out another Italian Renaissance term, the non finito, um, the deliberately unfinished. Um, yeah. So can you talk about that too? Um, I think that I deliberately do that so that things can feel um, still worth investigating and still feel like there's a sense of truth behind the making. Um, I often tell my peers and my family members, like, let's demystify art. Like, let's like take away the illusions around like the grandeur of making art because I feel like that's where the, the um, ideas of not being able to make it come from. You know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm if people could figure out or if people had the the teachings or learnings to understand like envelope process, um, the, the grid method, like etching, um, all these different things can help you push your compositional choices and the aspects of like how to finish and what not to finish, um, that comes from the sort of push and pull of what is a finished painting. And how do we dictate the finish line? Um, for me, I feel as though if certain things can be implied, then I can like leave it in that space almost and then move on to something else and flush that out more. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit too in this painting about um, the, the figure that's I, it, it's doing so many different things, right? Um, he could mm -hmm. be like, you know, like very successfully limboing <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> under under the the half circles on the the curtain here. Um, I also pulled an image of, for example, um, the the humans from Pompeii who had been mm -hmm. killed. Um, can you tell us what? Okay, what's going on here? Um, and also the the decision here to paint. I'm assuming him as though he is stone. Yeah. Um, so with this piece, I was thinking about admission, like the entry of a space, the cost of going into a space. Um, like, what does that look like when you aren't given access to a space? Growing up in like DC and my time in New York and seeing what like lines are for people, how people interpret these different moments where you're almost at the point of entry and how that can bring out different people um <laughs> especially in like a more of a nightlife setting you can definitely see like some people don't even believe in lines and wouldn't stand in a line or for instance for turnstiles they were thinking about where um new york is now with the um subway mta like ticketing and stuff like that okay. that's the sort of things i was thinking about to bring me to the point of creating all this connection, this intersection. And the choice of the marble figure was to speak towards that like halt period or that 
stage where you feel as though you're stuck because you don't have the the ticket or the thing that was needed to go on further or travel forward mm -hmm. and this is sort of a more or less metaphor of that space in my mind that's how i'm interpreting the um figure in the background is the um spiritual aid from like outside of the world giving um like this spool of tickets to this person mm -hmm. and there's the other figure that's sort of holding a chicken kind of like menacingly i would say like we know the knife and the chicken are going together somehow but we don't need to speak on how that <laughs> violence is going to enact but um it's that sort of awareness in this painting that i keep sort of like referencing and trying to bring back to our like understanding of okay we're entering this world like this world is now starting here and the figure i like the like arched back like rolled over itself sort of positioning because it makes it feel more dire or theatrical mm -hmm. and like the expression of like the hand over the chest is just like reaching out is just very um cinematic Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what I was going for with this. This is why it's also kind of referencing like a stage performance. Um, there's a lot of different uh, theatrics that will happen on a boardwalk to get your attention and to get your money. So that's another like, there's so many different things are firing off when I'm thinking about these paintings and building the paintings up. And with this one, that was a moment for me to have like clarity on that feeling as best as I can. Mm -hmm. it's also I mean it's just a bravura turn too right I mean um, mm -hmm. to, to have this this like very um crazily foreshortened figure in the foreground mm -hmm. um you know that this is a, a way that of course painters in the past but you also are showing you know what you can do um which yeah. I, I think is actually really really cool so when you when you make these paintings, um, how much are you thinking about your own autobiography? Are you telling stories from your lives or from your life or the, from the lives of your your relatives and ancestors? Um, are you posing for the paintings? Um, how much of, of it is you? Um, I would say a lot of it is me. Um, I'm a strong believer of using yourself as your muse when you don't have anyone to model for you. Um, I have an archive of photos of me like posing and gesturing myself in certain ways so that I can then paint um, what I'm seeing. Uh, otherwise, most of the stuff is just being, you know, brought up from my own imagination. Mm -hmm. But there are some figures in the paintings that are references to friends and those who are dear to me, people I admired from far and close. Um, so, for instance, there's... Like there's moments where you can, if you looked at me long enough, you could see where I come into my paintings and it's really funny. So back to the first slide or the one where it's um, at what cost do I stay or go? I'm the figure in the background, like holding the, or throwing the ticket um, spot, ticket spool. So I'm, I'm using myself as a reference and that's like me gesturing in the background, sort of like, how would this look if someone was to be standing and throwing something? And then I'll use that understanding from that and then implement it into my work. And um, a lot of this is coming from things that, lessons that you've learned that may not be your lesson, you know? Um, like if, for instance, if someone was to experience consequence and then had the you know, kindness to tell you, hey, don't do that because it's hot, then you then know not to do that same thing. So it's like that sort of learning that I came across, not so much a firsthand like experience, but more so mm -hmm. indoctrinating what I process from someone else. Um, in this one, you can see like there's certain features and moments in the face that are referential to my own face because I didn't know how it actually would look. So I would use like a mirror, <clears throat> I would use a mirror or like my iPad and like blow up the angle that I was using and then paint it out further. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it, it was funny to me, um, Nathaniel and I briefly met each other yesterday just before this conversation. And I, I was really struck by how much of you is in these paintings um, because I'd never <laughs> seen you before. And so I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I know I need to ask him about that. It's so funny. That's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in, in this painting and, and in others, there are um, what I can see as a lot of um, art historical precedents, um, either in the background, for example, in the background of this painting, um, the painting in the painting, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in others of your works, um, the, the poses of the figures, um, even just the way that you're, you're taking positions and perhaps looking at paintings from the past, but then rotating the figures mm -hmm. um, so that you're able to, to achieve that same position, but now totally changing the way that we understand it. Um, yeah. So I'm really interested in this. Um, what, are you, what are you looking at? And also how do you think about your work in relationship to um, the art history that you might be seeing in museums or online or whatever? Well, I'm a strong believer that like ideas can come to you without your control or without your true intentions. And that happens in moments where I may be looking at an image and I'm like, oh, that was interesting. And then later on, I go to my sketchbook and unknowingly I'll do something that's sort of close to what I've seen throughout the day. And then later on, someone who has a larger lexicon of our history than I do will pinpoint where I was at the time of seeing certain things because they know the art history in a different way or have a different relationship to it. So that's always like really fun to see. It mm -hmm. surprises me even in moments, but for like the idea of having like a painting within a painting that comes from me thinking that like, that's a good avenue to approach if I'm trying to, um, build a a new <laughs> yeah if I'm trying to build a a world up so like certain things have to sort of exist in the world in my mind for that to be valid and a painting in a paint within a painting is like a clear access point to that um I think about the um so I'm blanking on it the, the Sybil figure mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. I, I think about that figure because of its historical reference and its use like it is something that comes up again and again and I really like the relationship of the storytelling being presented to like a younger audience or the the youth so unquote um as a way of just like speaking towards teaching the younger ages um and that sort of echoes into the title itself um, the the passing down of knowledge and the the like transparency transparency of that sort of truth I think is what I was trying to achieve when bringing that into my own work is like this is something that's been happening for a while and will continue to happen like we must share the knowledge that we know to those who don't and keep that going and um, I, I really want to like sort of honor that moment when creating moments like this like oh sorry yeah yeah no um i was just gonna say so this this is uh ugo da carpi and this is actually a woodcut um after Raphael, and uh it's a a sibyl and so sibyls were um you know truth seers uh they could yeah. see into the future and um told people mostly bad news um but but, but we're yeah. able to to prophesize um about things about to happen and then the painting that nathaniel of course references this this woodcut in is um number 19 on my slide um show would you believe me if i showed you mm -hmm. and so i just want to give people that background yeah so then in, in this one the the characters actually the the image that the character is depicting comes from another painting that I made prior and it's again another way of like reinstalling or revalidating the world that I'm creating but um this is something that will come up in my work more further down the line of this creature 
that's sort of echoing throughout the work. Um, it's my connection to sort of a magical realism and a um, sort of interpretation to um, constructs of societal norms and how to dismantle and break those things, but it's ongoing. So right now you see it in piece and parts. And there's another moment where this exists at the bottom, the, the creature at least exists at the bottom of the faith of fishing. So if you look at the very like, the, the, the area where the net's casting and finally touching the water, you can see the dorsal fin of a sea monster of sorts. But that's sort of like, um, speaking towards the, the oh yeah, so at the bottom in this one, like it's gray, but it's a dorsal fin right there. If you go to the show, you'll be able to see it more in person, but that's a plug in to go to the show guys. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I use the, the civil to sort of reference that there is something coming and that there is something that is in their world that is sort of ominous that they're like trying to identify. And that's sort of me creating this like narrative of awareness of like the threats and like awareness of um, a sense beyond your, your, you know, beyond your senses, which is the other painting um, where there's a crocodile in the <laughs> like mid ground. Um, yeah, that one. I'm not sure which slide. That is, I'm trying to look right now, that is, the detail at least is um, slide 25. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a hint towards like the, the um, more ominous, omnipresent of um, things that are out of your control and sort of this moment where the figure itself, like she isn't aware of the danger and she doesn't know where the danger is, but the dog who has a higher sense can <laughs> like sense where the crocodile is, sees the crocodile. And um, that's like a moment of sort of that mystical aspect of mm -hmm. like the, the, the realm where like the, the protagonist is now being aided by like the spiritual side of things. Yeah, that's um, what that means. Um, it's, uh, so this is another painting that made me think about art historical precedents. Um, this woman is assuming what we would think of as like a classic, like Betty Page position, right? So like a pinup position, but of course pinups are, are taking their positions from like Venus sculptures. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you could think about, for example, the Venus um, interrupted at her bath, for example. And so that's yep. totally appropriate for your paintings, right? Because of yeah. course there's the water element and the, the being caught unawares element. Um, and then also the sense too of a little bit of menace here, um, whether it's from here, from within, or I think more interestingly for your work from without, right? And so then you do have this sense of the, the net casters actually needing to throw nets over the viewer, right? Mm -hmm. um, either to tether us in front of the painting, which is very clever on your part, um, yeah. or, or in fact, to, to kind of inoculate us, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, this is, this is, um, like a, a scopic threat here. Um, this is a really, really wonderful way of thinking about your paintings and the way that we interact with them. Thank you, yes, yes. Um, I would also make a moment to acknowledge Richard Mayhews. He is a painter, a colorist that I admire and I've been admiring him for a couple of years now. Um, the way in which he captured his landscapes, I thought were always very beautiful. And I wanted to, he was one of the figures or one of the artists that I wanted to pay homage to in terms of like my title. And I was referencing a lot of his sort of like brush stroke, his sense of um, color palettes, color waves. And then even to a point to think of like, okay, Richard Mayhew's painting is 
to the left of my painting. Like almost as if like me and Richard Mayhews are sitting on the same like riverbank and he's looking over there painting out like his landscapes and trees. And then I'm like adding my own like version of that sort of as a, um, a pick me up or piggyback off of what he's been doing prior. And then just kind of like showing that, um, like showing a reference to a world that's already fully like fleshed out and then showing like how people would exist or how I imagine people existing in this realm. Um, for instance, with the, um, the Hughes of May painting, that's me playing on his last name to kind of just like code it through. And um, I like doing that sort of stuff, even through like the art references, like the actual compositions and layouts. So like when you're thinking of the, the Venus pose, like Venus interrupted at, in her, at her bath, that's accurate to this moment because the choice of using that like pink and that color, like that reddish color is to present this sort of alarm in the space. Like you would imagine if this is like a normal beach day that there should be a lot of blue and like beautiful skies, but that awareness or that agitated moment comes from you interpreting the threat and seeing the color in part with the threat. So it's like all those things are happening and coming to the forefront. Mm -hmm. I really, really love the idea of you creating um, like transcontinental and, and transhistorical diptychs. In mm -hmm. fact, um, so not just diptychs of your own work, but diptychs with other people's works. Yeah. I, I love, love, love that idea. That's, that's such mm -hmm. an interesting way, especially of thinking about landscape. Um, the exactly. idea that it, this, this background um, location just continues um, mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout history and it can go forward and backwards. I really, really, really like that idea. Thanks. Um, one other painting that I just wanted to, to look at in terms of um, not necessarily a historical precedent that you said, but that I'm thinking of um, mm -hmm. is uh, again, slide 20. So this is ripples of you still return to my shores. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw this, I was really thinking of um, especially Courbet self-portraits um, and particularly in that kind of like the slouch and the lean, um, there's a, a wonderful um, kind of like self-confidence in, in this that I, I particularly like. And um, if we were to get, you know, very um, art historical about it, we could also start to think about the way that the shoulder moves forward so that you can be painting the painting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have that here with the, the Courbet self-portrait, um, you know, is, is, he, is he wounded after a duel? Is he wounded because of paint? Um, and then also looking at your, your own image. Um, and, and thinking about, again, that lean so that you have the one shoulder forward so that you're actually starting to reach out and make that painting. And so I'm really curious about this too, about the act of painting as being present in your paintings. I love that we're using this one for that question because this one took a lot out of me to make in terms of the, um, the window to make it, the feet in terms of the size and just trying to have that moment where I'm slowing down in moments and then moving faster in moments and like these choices just sort of coming together and unifying. Um, I really like the reference to that other, the other painting, the Corbet painting because of how it's analogous to um, the person I'm using as a reference. So his name's Hakeem Olanka, and he's a fellow painter that I know in New York. And he did a performance, I wanna say last year, September or something like that with his partner. And I was so moved by it that I remembered a lot of the, the dance and flow. And this was one of the moments where he and his, par his partner were like, gradually going to the floor together and he stood there he like held it for a second and then moved into the next thing so i later on just 
jotted that pose out and then asked him, can he like come in and like, can I get like a photo of him? Can I get some image references together? Okay. And then actually on one of the nights, he actually what came to my house and we just had a chance to build up the image and its likeness and think about the other attributes that create or sort of ground his identity in the painting. Um, the choice of like the posturing and the the elements of the landscape all come because of what I was thinking about in that theatrical moment, in that scene itself from that um, performance that he did. Um, now that you're saying this, I can totally see how you're using, for example, this this tent or tarp on the seashore to like fold back like a proscenium stage. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really, really nicely done moment. Um, I, I think also like those feet are just so weird. Um, I, I took a lot of photographs of them and then, and I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to use these details. And then when I looked at them later, I was like, they don't, they don't look like anything. Like they, you know, when you're looking at the image as a whole, they look recognizably as mm -hmm. clad feet. Um, but when you look at just details of them, they look like, I don't know, like sea slugs or, um, you know, like, or um, better for my purposes, pure painting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think this is a, a great way to, to move into what will be my last question for you, which is just this tension, tension um, between abstraction and figuration in your work. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a really productive tension for you. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I think is, is really, really interesting and um, something that we can't really sense in reproduction in your work. Um, this, is, this is fascinating to me that, that you and Karma have chosen not to give us details of your work, right? So we're, <laughs> we're looking at your paintings from a certain distance. And so we, we need to consume them if we consume them online as a whole. Um, sure. But if we go in person, we can actually start to pay attention to the surface of your work and start to see where you are engaging in aspects of pure painting, um, you know, where you're not necessarily storytelling, you're not um, referencing other people, you're actually like getting in there with your brush, with your fingers maybe, um, with a stencil mm -hmm. at certain points um, and really starting to engage the canvas. Um, and so I'm, I'm really curious about this. How, how are you building these works? How are you thinking about abstraction and like the painterliness of your paint? I think there is first, like I establish the ways in which I build a painting up. Um, having figured that out, I, I know that I normally work a lot thinner than I gradually build to thick. But in that time, the um, background and foreground, I'm already creating both of those things simultaneously. So when I'm finally at a stage where, okay, now I'm dealing with just the foreground, mm -hmm. I have elements from the background to control whether to expose or to hide. So for instance, in this painting, um, the pants, um, the pants come together because of sort of the, the absence of certain colors or the, the choice of not fully saturating that image out and just keeping the transparency there so that then when I contrast the outer layer with orange, now the color of that green and brown pop forward. So it's just like mm -hmm. having that sort of awareness of color sensory sensitivity helps mm -hmm. push the piece and like understanding like what different yellows look like brushed up against each other and how that can still convey like, okay, this is the yellow for the tint versus this is the yellow for the landscape. and pushing that space, um, that happens a lot. And I love this moment. This is happening through, um, they're like these cool little stencil brushes. I'm, I wanna get it another time. I don't have it next to me, but it's this sort of um, etching mechanism where first you paint in what you wanna fill in, and then you can use this tool to sort of like remove the paint and, and relieve some of those like colors and and um, touches underneath. Oh, I love this one. It's still um, this detailed moment. Those like stars, 
they actually come from the stars for um, like if you were like in grade school and you got an academic star, those are the exact same stars. I like went to a Staples and was like, you guys have those stars here? And then <laughs> they gave me those stars and I just created them as a um, pattern for the outfit. And it just made sense. Like I, it mm -hmm. was the sort of thing where I was like, how do I move efficiently in this moment? Because I was like, I could sit here and paint all these stars, but it, what's more important? Like the fact that I painted all these stars or that like, you can see a star yeah. you, you know what I mean mm -hmm. so that was sort yeah. of like the push and pull in terms of decision making with certain things where like if it got to a point where I felt as though it was conveyed then that allowed me um a moment of comfort to then move to the next thing and investigate a little further and then come back so I would work in layers and with oils you have to let things dry so <laughs> you have to just let it sit and over time with that, I think that allowed me to sort of see what really needed to be touched on and marked up again. And um, there's like, for instance, in this same um, painting, there's the handkerchief. You have that slide, right? The handkerchief and the um, pants. So the handkerchief, same thing with the star that I was speaking about before, but now I'm just like, cutting them up a little bit or like altering them so that they have a little um, variety to them. And then the pants, I first went in with um, just figuring out where in the composition the pants existed. And then I did sort of a French fry method to like get out the legs on both sides of the chair. And then I went back over top of that and sort of like did this fine like organic line to kind of gesture um, the drapery of jeans and clothing. Um, and also funny enough, this handkerchief is actually the same handkerchief on the Faith of Fishing, like the, his headpiece. So like, that's my way of like connecting the, the where's Waldo kind of moment, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that for like, uh, younger ages, that's a way to keep them investigated or, or engaged rather in the work and to give them something to kind of like search for and find inside of the paintings. Mm -hmm. um, if we could just end on slide 24, just so that people can see um, like what Nathaniel's talking about here about building up. Um, yeah. So this is the painting of the woman who's standing on the ship and she's holding a ship as well. These are the ropes behind her. And so you can really get a sense here um, of how deep <laughs> this painting is. Um, mm -hmm. While at the same time, I'm um, not being like super, super like physically deep, um, but just um, that again, that sense of layers, but then also um, here just doing total gestural painting. Um, mm -hmm. in this and really, really wonderful way. For me, I think that comes out of having a moment to breathe in, in making the work. So I remember when I was showing this to one of my friends like earlier out in um, I think it was like July or something like that. They were like, everything feels like really tight in the thing. Like we like I love your paintings, like I think they're cool, but everything just feels very like placed and tight and like controlled. And they were like, Where's those where are those like organic moments from last year? And it was just funny to hear that from someone who's like, you know, admiring the work and a friend of mine. But I was like, you know what, you're right. Like I need to reactivate that space where I'm allowing myself to sort of flow with the, the painting's direction. And when th certain things are implied, like the netting, I was like, <clears throat> initially I had only like the orange and the blue as the net color. I didn't have the yellow. So then I had to take that whole section out and then redo that so that then I could feel as though like there was more, um, elements and tangible things underneath that netting so that mm -hmm. you could feel the weight, you know, you could feel the gravity of the nets and the shadow casting made more sense in that way too. And it's just like a beautiful moment to just sort of be free of any sort of like reason or need for control. Yeah, and here here is the the full image, and you can see that um, you know when we're standing a certain distance back, we don't read that at all. You know, we just read mm -hmm. a maps behind her. Um, 
I don't know who this friend was, but that is really, really good observation there. And you should keep asking them back to your studio because oh, that course. clearly is huge. I mean, like, yeah. what, what a great observation for you. Wow. One of my longest friends, her name is Brianna, and I've been friends with her since, like, early high school. Yeah. And I've, I've always referenced, like, them in terms of, like, hey, let, let me paint you at some point. So this was finally a moment to really get that time in. And when I sat down and started the painting, I was like, I really need to do this correctly. Like there's a lot weighing on this moment. She knows me, her parents know me, like, mm, I'm not gonna mess this opportunity up. And this one, I was working from a photo. So that's another thing in my paintings. Some of the other faces are not from photos. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of tell the ones that have more of an uh, identity versus others, because mm -hmm. some faces are, because I'm using my own face to like create something else versus right. like um, three friends, Wednesday, Hakeem and Olike, I mean, Hakeem and Brianna, those three, um, I was able to sit with their faces longer and by doing so, and like also because they're in my realm, I was able to capture more from it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you and I'm um, so excited to go back and see the show again. My and pleasure. I encourage everybody else to as well. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Cal so that we can move this to the next section. Great. Thank you, Amanda. This has been really wonderful. And Nathaniel, I can't wait to see the show myself. Um, it's been a great, a great discussion. Thank you. Um, so the first question we have from the audience today, I'm going to read on behalf of GE Schwartz. And GE says, it seems as though your work is such an articulation of boundaries and their multiple layerings. When was that point, that moment when you had that flash of recognition of discovering how potent thresholds and their depictions could be? Thank you. Um, I would say the moment of acknowledging that. Um, I think it probably happened post the graduation, like 2019 or so. I was creating these paintings initially that didn't have any type of like depth to them. They were more so just these cutouts and they're very iconographical. But then over time, I felt as though for me to like really create worlds, I needed to have an understanding of like foreground, background and midground. And then I started to investigate that more after that moment. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, GE. Um, I'm next going to hand it over to my colleague, Eleanor. Thank you. Is my, is my audio okay for now? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, thank you so much, Nathaniel and Amanda. This has been an absolutely lovely and really inspiring conversation. Um, Nathaniel, I really love the titles of your work so much, um, and they are so, I don't know, you have a really beautiful way with words as well as with paint and with uh, visual imagery. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your literary references or um, inspirations and then also if you have a practice of poetry or any type of writing that and how it relates to your painting. Um, yeah, I'm a strong believer of letting certain hobbies stay hobbies. Um, and poetry and like writing, like that's one of the ones where I respect it as a different um, way of making. And I hold it at that regard. But at the same time, it is something that I really like in terms of grounding a painting or giving a certain scene or sense of mood or tension to a painting. And my titles come from a lot of different spaces. Like I would say some of the titles in this show come from like my notes, like from three or four years ago where I was thinking about a title and then like it made sense to me, but then I didn't have a painting to go with the title. And then over time, like the painting came together then I go back to the notes and I'm like, oh, there's the title. Um, and then also, in my mind, um, oh, I don't have that note here, but I initially wrote that out as like a poem. And if you, I'll have to like get the other um, 
script for it, but initially like the curation was supposed to be laid out into a poem, but we didn't get to that point. And I felt like that was too much for, that was like too artsy of a desire of my own to like present that, you know, as a curatorial choice. So um, I divorced myself from that idea, but still kept on hold to the titles themselves. And I'll go back and forth, like workshopping the titles. Um, I'll like sit back and be like, hmm, do you believe me if, would you believe me if I told you? Like, does that make sense? Like, how can that be like misinterpreted? Where can that be taken to? Like, I try to, you know, um, troubleshoot the, the title to myself a little bit. And then over time, it just sort of grounds itself in, and focuses on the title. So like, for instance, um, Ripples of You Still Return to My Shore. That was from a poem that I made post a breakup like a couple years back. And then when I was making this painting, I was thinking about like that sort of return to love or the um, idea that like, love can still find you. Then I landed onto this painting and I was like, oh, that's really beautiful. Like that's a serendipitous moment almost. So that's how I landed on some of these titles, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing, thank you so much. Would you, would you share some of your favorite authors or poets too? Um, yeah, Sonia Sanchez, uh, Gino Diaz, um, Octavia Butler, um, there's a couple, um, well, that's just like a couple off the top just to give to you right now, yeah. Amazing, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, Eleanor and Nathaniel, really, thank you for all of this, for your time today. This has been a really wonderful conversation and thank you to Amanda for facilitating it so wonderfully. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to uh, also give a big thank you to the team at Karma uh, for their support in in preparing today's event we'd also like to thank the Terra foundation for american art for sponsoring our nse program making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive which you can view on the rails youtube channel the rail has been free and independent for 23 years a donation directly supports our writers production staff and operations support our work through the link in the chat and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation on the Brooklyn Public Library with Linda E. Johnson, Robert Lester Kenton, Damaris Olivo, and Reverend Dr. Donna Scaper. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congrats. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest Bye. of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.